Welcome. We're going to be talking about 20th century music. Um, we're going to be talking mostly about classical music. Classical music. It's a art music. Um, though, especially in the 20th century, that intersects with lots of different kinds of music. We're going to be talking about jazz, gamelan music, different influences, um, electronic music. A um, couple of things to take into account. First of all, instead of one coherent body of music, um, we are talking about a lot of different kinds of music. Um, there's a ton of different political, cultural, social, philosophical enclaves um, th that really deserve attention when we talk about 20th century music history. Um, and it all sounds different across the board. Um, a lot of the information that I'm talking about uh, is coming from a fabulous book by Alex Ross called The Rest is Noise, Listening to Music uh, in the 20th Century. and it is a fabulous book. You should read it. Alex Ross is the music critic for the New Yorker magazine, um, and he does a really nice job of bringing some of these stories to life. And that's exactly what I'm going to try to do for you. I'm going to try to distill some of those stories um, and weave some things together to give us a sense of uh, where we're coming from. Remember that music is an expression of culture, but it also drives culture. There is uh, there's a dialogue that happens innately um, as culture moves forward. So so it's hard to tell sometimes in the in the moment what music means, where it's coming from, um, and sometimes with some historical perspective, we can start to make sense of that. Um, our story is going to start in 1906 in the Austrian city of Graz for the premiere of Richard Strauss's opera Salome. But that's actually chapter two because I feel it's really important before we get into 20th century music and who those main players are in that particular moment where a lot of different threads are going to come together. I want to back up just a second and talk about some of uh, what came before. So we're going to uh, talk about um, the music of the 1800s, the Romantic period. Uh, the 1800s gave us what we think of as one of the beefiest parts of the classical music repertoire. Uh, there's going to be a lot of air quotes every time I say classical. Remember that we say classical music to represent art music as an umbrella, so Baroque, Classical, Romantic, um, 20th century music. There is classical music throughout that, but there was also the classical period within that. Um, so that represents more specific years, and that can be confusing. I didn't make it up. It's not my fault. I'm still sorry. Um, but let's review Beethoven. When Beethoven started composing, he, he was living in the classical period, and his music changed so much that by the end of his writing, um, he, we were in the Romantic period. Uh, he was dead by 1827. Schubert died in 1828. Mendelssohn, a composer in his own right, um, but he was also the one who modernized the role of the conductor in the way we think about it now. He also was the one who brought uh, J.S. Bach's work back into the light. The work of Bach had been lost in the 1700s. And then Mendelssohn rediscovered him and started programming his work. 1830, Hector Berlioz completed Symphony Fantastique. Do you remember that one? That was uh, about his obsession with actress Harriet Smithson. It had a depiction of opium dreams and his own fictitious execution by guillotine. Check out our other videos on Hector Berlioz for more information. Frederick Chopin, the great pianist, was busy performing and composing through the 1830s, and he also revolutionized the piano through the use of the pedals, um, using new kinds of sustain with the sustain pedal. Johannes Brahms was born in 1833. George Bizet, who wrote Carmen, was born in 1838. Tchaikovsky was born in 1840. That was, by the way, the same year that the clarinet was redesigned to its current form. Uh, things aren't just happening in Europe, though. Um, in 1846, the New York Philharmonic was formed in, uh, back in Europe. Uh, in Italy, Giuseppe Verdi, one of the great Italian opera composers, wrote La Traviata. Um, that was in 1853. In 1856, the first Steinway piano was built by Henry Engelhard Steinway. It's worth mentioning um, both with Chopin and the, and the use of pedal, and then Steinway with the sort of new piano uh, design. Um, or a more perfect piano design. Um, technology around music 
was also part of this dialogue. Um, people were de de developing new instruments um, as new new ideas sort of demanded that, as new as new uh, performance styles demanded that. But also, as people developed new instruments, that would then influence what music was being composed. Um, the great Italian opera composer Giacomo Puccini was born in 1858. Uh, in 1859, the first opera house in New Orleans was opened. Claude Debussy was born in 1862. Remember his name? He becomes one of our main characters in 20th century music. Uh, uh, you can, he often gets aligned artistically with the Impressionist paintings using sounds like Monet, um, used to paint sort of washes of color. Um, Richard Strauss will kick off our next chapter. He's, he's the one who composed Salome. Um, he was born in 1864. Amy Beach, the great American composer, was born in 1867. And hooray, we have a woman. Uh, that doesn't mean she was the first female writing great music, um, but she was one of the first to earn recognition in this sea of old dead white guys. And that is a, uh, that is a whole separate political issue that I would be delighted to, to uh, address. And I'm really delighted that that paradigm is shifting. Um, but uh, in 1868, uh, Rossini, the great Italian opera composer died in 1874, we had the birth of two of our big 20th century characters, American composer Charles Ives and uh, Austro-German composer Arnold Schoenberg, who we're going to talk about quite a lot in some future chapters. In 1876, the music to Peer Gint was composed by Edvard Grieg, that's in the Hall of the Mountain King and those. In 1877, we have the first performance of Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky. Bela Bartok was born in 1881. He was Hungarian and one of the great composers of the 20th century using folk music from Eastern Europe in his compositions along with his colleague Zoltan Kodai. The Russian composer Igor Stravinsky was born in 1882. We're going to talk more about this later as, as well. Though he was born in Russia, he sort of considered a French composer um, because he was living there and, and that was the, the ideology, he shared an ideology with, with the composers there as opposed to the composers of the Austro-German world. We're going to get into that. Um, in 1883, the Metropolitan Opera opened in New York City and Richard Wagner died. We'll talk a lot about Wagner in just a second. Franz Liszt, maybe the greatest pianist who ever lived and a virtuosic composer, he died in 1886. Eric Satie is another French composer and uh, he, he's going to be one of our characters in 20th century music. At age 22, uh, composed Gymnopédie No. 1, and that was right around the same time that Carnegie Hall was opened in 1891. Uh, Brahms died in 1897. That was the same year that Gustav Mahler took over directing Vienna Art Opera, and Mahler figures in heavily in, the, in our first story um, about Solomon. So we're getting there. Uh, outside of classical music, we have we have uh, ragtime music. Scott Joplin published Maple Leaf Rag in 1899, and we're going to be talking about how jazz music interacted with the classical music world. Um, and that's 1899. That's bam. That brings us to the 20th century. So these composers represent a huge swath of style, of philosophy, of nation of origin, of experience, um, etc. And so do the composers that we're going to be talking about this year, several of whom, of course, we mentioned here. And we can't talk about every aspect of every composer, nor do we have time to dive into every aspect of the socio-political context in which we find them. But I want to share some stories that put a spotlight on some of the themes that influenced or were influenced by the music of the 20th century. Um, so to kind of frame that, I want to look for a second at the work of Richard Wagner. Um, he was a giant in um, music at the end of the 1800s. He was from, he was a composer from the town of Bayreuth. He was demanding, he was exacting in every aspect. Usually opera would be written with a composer um, writing the music and a librettist writing the words or the libretto. Uh, oftentimes if there was dancing there would be a separate choreographer. Uh, Wagner did all of this. He, he micromanaged every element 
down to the physical specs for the opera house. He designed an entire hall specific for his operas. It had configurations for these outlandish special effects that he was using, and it was designed specifically for the acoustics of his music. And it, this is kind of cool, it had intentionally uncomfortable seats uh, so that people would stay awake throughout his long operas. Um, they were also fantastical and wild, and uh, they um, took on themes of mythology, of grail quests, of... Um, here's an example. The Ring Cycle is four operas long. It came around 15 hours in total. Um, but it was fantastical. Think Lord of the Rings, but with Norse mythology, and it's an opera. There were some recurring themes. Um, in the ring cycle, Votan, the chief of the gods, loses control of his realm and sinks into kind of a feeling of powerlessness. Um, and if you think about like the, the bourgeoisie, the, the, the rich of old Europe um, coming up against a new modern Europe with the rise of the middle class, um, Votan resembles the head of a great bourgeois family whose livelihood is destroyed by modernizing forces. Um, that he himself has actually set into motion. Um, his last opera, Parsifal, it's a telling of the quest for the Holy Grail. And there's a political subtext in, in the way he depicts it. And it, it's, it's really an analysis of the age. And again, remember that the music is a response to the culture, but then also drives the culture. His, his work influenced all these people. Um, as I mentioned, Wagner's themes didn't jive with everybody. Composers like Puccini rejected the mystical subjects Wagner used. Um, in Wagner's work, you have these godlike characters that are doing human things. Puccini kind of reversed that, did different, um, looked at that in a different way. Puccini uh, used a form of opera that was called opera verite or verismo, realism. He features, uh, instead of godlike characters who are behaving as humans on the stage, he takes very human characters prostitutes, gangsters, street urchins, um, and he gives them mythic dimensions by putting them on the stage. Um, the French composers kind of had their own thing going. They were not so keen on Germanic culture since the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and 1871. Um, Claude Debussy is busy working on a new musical language that feels very French, and a lot of the French composers um, use a similar kind of thing. Eric Satie was writing, as Alex Ross puts it, Oases of Stillness, which we're going to talk later about minimalism. The music of Eric Satie is not minimalist, but it sure feels like a precursor to it. Um, this kind of music is in stark contrast to the over-the-top, lush, fantastical operas of Wagner. There's also people who were really attached to classicism, to, to, to the old world, to the proper, to the bourgeois, to the, um, think, think, think Vienna, think old classical Vienna. Vienna was a classical city. Um, for example, when the waltz showed up in Vienna, people were scandalized. Um, in the 1800s, the waltz arrived thanks to Johann Strauss II. It was scandalized because suddenly men and women were holding each other close to each other on the dance floor. <sighs> But then once the hubbub died down, the waltz actually became a Viennese institution. Um, and I mention that just because there's a constant churning of acceptance and rejection around this axis of what is new. And so things develop in this push and pull. Um, I also mention it because we're about to talk about Richard Strauss. And it's worth noting that Richard Strauss is from a musical family. His father was a horn virtuoso, but that he is not related at all to the other famous Strauss family, Johann's family. Um, that's the one that was famous for the waltz. And I, I wanted to mention that also because we're about uh, to be talking about Richard Strauss, who was a classical snob in his earlier days. So Strauss is one of these composers who's really taking us forward into the 20th century um, in sort of a, a big rocket forward kind of way. But when he was young, he rejected music like Wagner's fantastical work. Richard Strauss um, actually mocked some of the specific musical devices that Wagner used. Uh, for example, there's a passage in Wagner's Die Valkyrie that juxtaposed chords of G and C sharp. Um, and though he mocked it when he heard it in Wagner's music, later Richard Strauss used the exact same keys intersecting on the very first page of Salome. And um, in that way, Wagner sets the stage. And here we are at the premiere of Salome, 1906, 
It is Graz, Austria, and it is the start of our story, which you will hear next time.